Perfect. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today we are going to be talking about flies. So those are the dipterans. Um, flies are going to be the only insect that, as an adult, have two wings. All right. Um, most insects, uh, things like dragonflies and butterflies and damselflies and beetles and grasshoppers and praying mantids, pretty much every insect that you can think of that has wings has four wings, has a front pair and a back pair. And when we're looking at the dipterans today, while well, we're looking at the flies, these are going to be insects with only two wings. So um, we'll be checking out the adaptation that replaces the hind wing. Um, that's called the haltier. Um, now, I'm going to start off by saying that flies aren't my favorite, alright? Um, dipterans were always kind of the hardest for me to identify, um, and that is just strictly because sometimes when you're identifying flies, you're looking at individual hairs and where those hairs are, um, and that can be fairly difficult, or has been difficult for me. Um, and so we're going to be looking at that. We also have this really cool reference that I'm going to that I'm going to show you real quick, um, right here. This is this really cool reference to um, fly anatomy. All right. So if, for instance, we are looking at the notochordon, it's this little triangle right here, and some flies have X number of hairs right here. Or um, and this is really cool because it's a because it's a clickable clickable piece of art that tells you exactly what they are and it gives you a definition over here so like you can click the compound eye it says an eye made of many omatidia right so I made of lots of little itty bitty facets um, they're used they used to have a link to all of the dipteran forms um, but once the once um, Java, I think it was Java crashed or stopped stopped playing. A lot of these features went away, and now they're working on creating new ones. That's fine. All right, so that's some that's a that's a tool that we're probably going to be using over the course um, to help you kind of see things and to help me kind of point things out on the microscope. Um, if if that gets a little complicated, cool. Yay! Awesome. So, um, other than that, I would like to get started. And today we're going to be starting with the tipulids or the crane flies. <coughs> crane fly. I'm going to make the font just a little bit smaller so that the other ones don't get too big. And over the course of the day, you'll see me, I am teaching my Word um, program. <laughs> I'm teaching Word how to speak in entomology. So I'm teaching them all of the family names. You'll see me adding them to the dictionary. Um, that's just so that if I misspell them in the future, I know um, it'll actually uh, underline them. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Perfect. Alright, so um, we're going to be looking at the crane fly. Now, this crane fly, crane flies come in a variety of sizes. This one is a pretty large crane fly that we're going to be looking at. Now, this crane fly, let's see, there we go. Now, um, this crane fly, a lot of times people will see these big crane flies and there are some old wives tales about them. Some people think that they eat mosquitoes. They do not eat mosquitoes. These guys are not mosquito killers. They're not male or female mosquitoes. They are in a completely different family as mosquitoes. They're not related. These are crane flies. And we're going to be looking at the crane flies back. All right, so um, you'll notice that this light turns on. It's just so that we can see better on the microscope. All right, let's check the microscope. I'm not 
going to be taking the crane fly out of this container because crane flies have very, very, very fragile legs and I'm afraid of hurting it. So, um, this is only a little bit unfortunate. Here, I'm going to tilt the pin just a little bit so that you can see that a little bit better. Now, the characteristic on, if you were actually trying to identify a tapulid, so you were looking at a characteristic that's unique on this insect that other insects don't have, it's this V-shaped, um, it's this V-shaped suture on its back. So if you're looking right here, um, a suture is kind of like a crevice. So I'm going to, really quick. So a suture, if you imagine an exoskeleton, um, an exoskeleton is, is a hard external layer, right? And so a lot of times the exoskeleton is flat. But sometimes they have sutures, which are where the exoskeleton com kind of comes down and goes back up. So it's kind of like a little, I guess, like a little canal in the exoskeleton where there's just like this little divot. All right. So that's going to be a suture. And it tends to be where two kind of scler sclerites meet. So where two pieces of the exoskeleton meet and fuse. All right. So if we're looking at the suture right here it's this line in the exoskeleton, it's V-shaped. And in crane flies, in crane flies, they have this V-shaped suture on, they call it the mesonotum, all right, the middle part of the thorax. All right, so that's going to be your characteristic for all tapulids, for all crane flies. They have this V-shaped suture. Um, that's easy enough. give you a cool view of the crane fly before we say goodbye. Yeah, so um, they don't they don't eat mosquitoes, ladies and gentlemen. There's no need to squish them. All right. Now my next specimen, you're going to laugh because um, the next family that we are doing are the culicids or the mosquitoes. All right, so does it help that I when I write characteristics on here, like for the crane fly, the V-shaped suture? Okay. Um, so we're talking about, I'm gonna fix this. Sorry guys. I don't like spacing in between my lines. I like to control that. Perfect. All right. So for culicity, um, so for culicity or for the mosquitoes, um, you're gonna laugh at me because I only have, I have only ever collected a single mosquito, as it turns out, um, or so far. I will be collecting more in the future. All right. Now my mosquito specimen is kind of old and its abdomen has since fallen off. I pinned it when I was younger, but it exists. And there's this really cool characteristic on mosquitoes that we're going to be looking at, and that is that mosquitoes have, I guess they call them scales. They've got these scales on their wing veins. So let's check that out. All right, 
so what we are looking at here is the wing of a mosquito all right and this wing is characteristic of all mosquitoes so um and there are not any other families of diptera there are not any other types of flies that have this where they have all of these long scales or long hairs that run along the veins of the wings so you can see their wings are kind of furry or fuzzy but they're only but it's only furry or fuzzy along the veins of the wings and then along the edges so all mosquitoes have these kind of really pretty um furry wings and i guess not a lot of not a lot of people um think that about mosquitoes that they can actually be pretty but you look close enough at any insect and you can find something pretty about it something unique something interesting that's kind of why i love them So yeah, that's going to be, you can see that's the entire specimen, but I want to see if we can see the head at all. It might be bad. I haven't looked at it yet. Eh, it's not horrible. All right. So anyway, the characteristic on mosquitoes, you don't have to look anywhere on the body. You don't have to look on its head. All you have to do is look at its wings. And if the mosquito has these veins or these hairs along the veins of its wings, then you know it's a mosquito. Easy enough. Alright, your next friend... I like to get it a little bit started for you guys so that there's not too much refocusing going on. All right, so the next the next fly that we're gonna fly type that we're gonna be looking at, we're gonna be looking at the soldier flies. Um, and these flies can be a variety of really pretty colors. They can be kind of pretty yellows and greens. Um, this one is mostly kind of like a yellow brown color, so it's not the prettiest um, of the soldier flies. Soldier flies are um, the strat stratiomyidae. Soldier flies. Okay. And we're going to be looking at the characteristics, but I'm going to write it down so that you guys can see. I'm going to move me over a little bit. There. Okay. It, we're going to be looking at a pentagonal fiscal cell. It's really hard to say it any other way, but I swear it's not that difficult to see once we start looking at them. All right, so we are looking at a soldier fly. We're going to be zooming in on the wing. There it is. Soldier flies have a pentagonal discal cell. There it is. It's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to argue with this. So you can see one, two, three, four, five. Um, this five-sided cell. All stratiomyids have them. All soldier flies have them, and that's how you tell them apart from everybody else. Um, I can say a lot of times sight IDing to family is is easier because a lot of times there's a handful of characteristics that are going to be able to get you to where you need to go. You just need to know what those characteristics are. So um, this is the discal cell. If you, we want to zoom out a little bit further on this guy. Um, this is our soldier fly, right? So we're looking at the front wing. Um, we've got the costa and then the subcosta, those are those two thick veins right there. 
Um, this is going to be your discal one cell, and you can see it's pentagonal, or it's five-sided. Um, we did mention that flies only have two wings, right? So they have um, a replacement to their hind wing, and it's called a halter. And we can see it really well right here, so I kind of wanted to point it out. This thing that looks like it's kind of sticking out from the side of the body and it has this knob at the end of it, this is called a halter. And this is what has replaced the hind wing of flies, and it helps them balance while they're in the air. So it's kind of like a... I forgot the plane's name for it. Yeah, but these guys, when they're flying around in the air, it kind of helps them balance. So if we want to look at it as a whole before we put it away, this is what my soldier fly looks like, and you can see that it has those pent pent pentagonal cells on both wings. Awesome. All right, so we've got that stratiomyidae. All right, um, the next one, uh, the next guys that we're going to be looking at have a reputation for not being the nicest of flies. Um, I can tell you that they, these flies definitely showed up at a pool once or twice when I was growing up. They unfortunately got splashed with water sometimes. These guys are going to be the deer flies or the acillidae. Or not the acillids. The acillids are robber flies, guys. The tabanids. So, these are going to be the horse and the deer flies. These guys tend to be a little bit um, meatier of flies. They kind of be kind of stocky and bulky and heavy, and they also tend to fly really heavy in the air. Um, those are just observations that I've made from them in the past. Um, now, the characteristic on tabanids, or the characteristic to identify the horse versus the deer flies, is actually pretty simple. Alrighty. Turn on the light. That would help. Alright, so you'll notice that as we're going through these families, a lot of the characteristics are on the wings and that's true of a lot of flies the the easy for me the easier characteristics are the ones that are on the wings because um, wing venation tends to be really it's to the point you see it or you don't um, hairs on the body for me tend to be a little bit more difficult alright so we are looking at the wing I'm gonna be zooming in on the tip of the wing right about here. Alright, perfect. So, as we are looking at the tip of the wing, you'll notice that this vein right here splits and it goes up to the top and it goes down to the bottom and it holds the end of the, it kind of circles the tip or it encloses the wing tip. Right? So that's going to be the characteristic of all deer flies and horse flies. All right? This is called the, these are the R4 and R5 veins, and they go and they split to go above and below the wingtip. So they enclose the wingtip, and you're never, ever going to have another vein inside of here that goes to the tip or around the tip or in here, right, if you have a robber fly or if you have a deer fly. So if you have a deer fly, you're going to have this R4 and R5 that enclose 
the wingtip. And that's true for all um, for all species in this family. So this was the largest robber fly that we just looked at, but we can also look at a smaller um, we can also look at a smaller robber fly. All right, and if we zoom in on that wingtip, we're gonna see. Yep. So we can see this R4 and R5, and they're also enclosing the wingtip, right? And that's the characteristic we're going to be looking for. And so, hello, how are we doing today? Let me get that on our... So the Dibanid are the deer flies, and they have the R4 and 5. Perfect. Just so that you guys can look at them. And the reason that I kept saying acylid as we were talking about the robber flies is because the acylids are next. So we're going to be looking at the... We're going to be looking at the robber flies. And if any of you follow um, my Facebook page, the, uh, the, the bee hunter or the bee mimicking robber fly was the guess that bug today. So I figure we can kind of look at him. Alright, so with the robber flies, the character that you're gonna wanna the character that you wanna know is that in between the two eyes, so we've got these really big compound eyes, and in between both of the compound eyes, um, there's kind of a divot. Alright, so we can say something along the line of um, depression between eyes. Let's check it out. Ladies and gentlemen, so as we're looking at this, this is the, here, I guess we can kind of turn it. So that it makes sense for you. Okay, so as we are looking at the head of this robber fly, at the head of this acylid, you can see that the eye it ends up here and then there's this divot. In between the in between the two eyes, so the head kind of stops here. This guy is fuzzy, so that kind of um, messes with the border. But you'll see that there's this divot in between the two eyes, or you can say that the eyes expand beyond the head. You can say that too about robber flies. If we look at a robber fly with a little less hair on its head. I also think that sometimes robber flies can look like little old men because they'll also have these like long gray hairs in their face sometimes. All right, so if we're looking at the, this head, you can see that um, the eyes are expanded above the head and there's this divot in between the eyes. And so that's the character that you're looking for for all robber flies. All robber flies are gonna have this really nifty little divot. I think that they definitely look like little old men. Alrighty. So, we got rabbit flies down. Rabbit flies can be a variety of sizes. And so, if you look, I've got. There are five rabbit flies here in this container. So,. Um, from here to there, any guys in these in this row, those five are all robber flies. So they can be fairly large, and they also can be pretty small. Um, I love that they like to mimic bees. There's a whole genus 
There's a whole group of robber flies that mimic bees. All right. This next one took me a minute to identify. We're going to be talking about bombelids. So these are going to be the bombelids or the bee flies. And we're going to be looking at, um, I'm trying to say this in a way that kind of everybody would understand. wing veins similarly wavy and I'll show you what I mean by that right now. So we're going to be looking at the bee flies wing venation and what we're going to want to see is we want to look at kind of the tip and this one is not as significant as some bombelids can be. So, um, we are looking at these veins. These are the R, these are some more R veins. So we've got R2 and 3, and then we've got R4. Yeah. So we've got, this one's R4, and then these are R2 and 3. And then if we're looking at the kind of the waviness on this vein right here and here, you can see that they kind of, they parallel each other, and that's going to be the characteristic for bee flies. Although this is not as distinctive as I've seen others in this family. Sometimes this, you see how deep this, wa this wave goes? Sometimes the top vein also goes equally as deep and so they kind of run, run parallel, run next to each other. Um, this guy, I would say that the top vein does not wave as much as the bottom vein. Um, but he's an odd, they're all, this is also an odd genus inside of the family, so I guess it's what he gets for being a little odd. Yeah, alright, so that's the characteristic we're going to be looking at for these guys, and I will say that, um, that as I'm going through these, I know that that guy is right, but the character can be on and off, right? So sometimes, just like the English language, there are rules um, and they're meant to be broken. Sometimes insects break the rules too. Like, um, so this isn't a fly, but it's fair game because it's a bug story. Um, like. Uh, I'm sure since you were a young child, you were told over and over and over again that all insects have six legs. There are insects that have legs that don't have six legs. Those, um, there are these, this type of beetle, and these beetles are called patent leather beetles. Um, and as grubs, as immatures, they only have four legs. When they become an adult, they eventually get six legs. And so um, they don't have four legs for their entire lifespan, but there is an insect out there that has four legs. Um, so insects believe that all rules are meant to be broken. Alright, so the next family that we're going to be talking about are the surfeits. Let me give myself a little bit of room. All right, so if we are looking at the surfids or the flower flies, we're gonna be wanting to look at the um, at the margin of the wing 
And then we're going to be looking at something that's called the spurious vein. All right, so it has a spurious vein, and you're going to see that in a minute. Spurious vein. And um, we're going to say the veins don't reach the margin. Um, and we'll see exactly what you mean my, what I mean by that in one moment. All right, so these are the surfids. These are the flower flies. And surfids tend to be bee mimics. All right, so I guess we can zoom out really quick and look at them. A lot of surfids. Cool. All right, so a lot of surfids have these black and yellow stripes along the abdomen. Um, they're going to be found around flowers. They're going to be flying amongst bees. And so you may not even be able to tell the difference. Um, this is going to be a flower fly. Now the big difference if you wanted to tell a fly from a wasp or a bee is that flies are only going to have two wings. That's hard to tell while they're flying. So you can also look at their antenna. Um, Bees and wasps tend to have elongate antenna that you can see very, very well. Um, a lot of times, the these guys are going to have um, small, they call it aristate antenna, but they're almost like a little sausage with a hair on the end of it. So they don't aren't very long. Now, um, now that we know it's a fly, we can look to check and see if it's a flower fly. Let's see if we can get to focus back. Focus back, come. There we go. All right, so you'll notice this is what we call the margin of the wing. This is the edge of the wing. And none of these veins go all the way to the edge. They all stop. It's almost like there's a barrier in between the edge of the edge of the wing and where the veins are even allowed to be. And you'll notice that. So that is the characteristic for flower flies or surfids, along with the spurious vein. I mentioned it, but I, and I said we would see it. So let's check it out. This is the spurious vein. It looks like there's a crease in it, so I was trying to get it focused better. Um, but the spurious vein starts in the base and it goes straight through and then it doesn't connect to anything. All right, it just kind of ends. It's like a spur. All right, this is the spurious vein. Um, so it comes through, it starts, it just kind of ends and you'll see the spurious vein on both sides. Yeah, so you'll see this, you'll see the same vein on each side. This side's a little more difficult to see because it actually runs along what looks like the body back there, so it's a little darker. But the spurious vein starts here, it goes straight through, it ends about right here. Alright, and you'll notice none of the veins reach the margin. So that's how you are going to be able to tell your hoverflies and flowerflies versus any of your versus any of your other flies. All right, Califorids. Califoridy in a buggy world. Only you guys are allowed to hear that. <laughs> Come on, I didn't spell it wrong, I promise. Add to dictionary. 
All right, the Californity, the Californity are the blowflies. All right, so there are a handful of characteristics that we are going to be, um, that we're going to be looking at. But the one characteristic that I like, the one that I think makes the most sense, is that the R5 cell um, narrows um, narrows at the end. All right, let's check that out. So we are looking at a Californid. Now, Californids are the blowflies. Um, types of types of blowflies would be things like the green bottle, the green bottle fly, well, the blue bottle fly and the green bottle fly, right? So either of those shiny flies that you'll see at kind of dead animals, those are going to be Californids. A lot of times, if you see maggots on an animal. Um, those are going to be Californids and a mixture of other closely related flies. Alright, so if we are looking at the, this is the wing of our blowfly, and this is R5, and you can, the R5 cell. And so you can see right here, um, this is the cell that the R5 vein makes, and at the end it narrows. Alright, so if we were to draw the cell out, you can see that it doesn't end way out here at the end of the wing, right? If it did, it would enclose the end and it would be, um, and it would be a deer fly, right? But instead, it clo comes all the way up here and it narrows at the end, and it tells me that it's a Californid. Now, this guy, because he's a Californid, he's a green, this is a green bottle, and so I figured we would really quick check out the really cool iridescent body of this fly. Um, the iridescence on these, the iridescence on flies doesn't go away after they die. And that's because their color, this color is a, um, a structural color and not a pigmented color. So there's, um, the structure, the shape of the small crystals that make up the exoskeleton give it this iridescent kind of color. That'd make a really, really cool picture. I might have to make one of these guys the bug of the week. All right. So those are Califords. Now, I will admit... I will admit that overall my collection is pretty light on flies. There are a number of different families of flies that I would like to talk to you guys about but just don't have specimens to show you. So that's going to be something that I work on um, through next year is really trying to focus on collecting more, um, more families of flies. I might even set up some traps to see if, uh, see if that helps me out a little bit. All right, who's next? Califorids. You are next. We're going to talk about the Tachinids. <coughs> Excuse me. So, for instance, the Muscids are houseflies. And I haven't collected myself a housefly yet. And so that's one that I'm going to have to just collect. I probably will be able to collect a housefly this winter. Um, so I'm going to probably do that. And then the other one that I'd like to talk about are the sarcophagids or the flesh flies. And those guys I should also be able to find for you. Um, and so I'm just going to have to, just going to have to find a rotting animal on the side of the road, sweep it out a little bit. All right. So for the kittens, we're going to we're going to be calling well you're going to laugh at me, but for all of the other insects, their Latin name was a little bit different than their common name, right? Flower flies or serpids or blowflies or californids. The tachinidae are we just call them tachinids. All right. So we kind of 
their common name is based off of their scientific name. And normally, they are super spiky. All right, so that's going to be one characteristic that a lot of people are going to be saying, like, there are other flies that are super spiky. Yes, there are other types of flies that are super spiky. But if you see that it's super spiky, you've at least got it narrowed down to a handful of families. All right, and so when we're looking at tachinids, if you want to narrow it down from all of the other super spiky flies, um, you're, we're talking about something called the post scutellum, and we'll look at it, is developed and prominent, is big, is large, enlarged, we're going to call it enlarged. I believe it's one word, but they're telling me, they're trying to tell me it's two words. All right, so let's check this out. because you're going to say that's enlarged but for truly it is I promise you <laughs> okay perfect all right so I just want to look at this really fast this is the tachinid that we're going to be zooming in on. All right, you'll already notice that it is super spiky. It has these spines all over its abdomen, all over its thorax, its head. Um, and we're going to be zooming in. We're going to be zooming in on the characteristics of this fly. Um, what we're looking for is right about here. So this little tri this little piece right here, this is what in flies they call the scutellum. Well, you'll notice that it's in a little bit of a different place than what we called the scutellum of a pentatomid, of a stink bug that we talked about last time. So sometimes um, entomologists will use the same word for different body parts on different types of bugs. That's not confusing at all. Anyway, this is the scutellum. Um, and if we are looking at the scutellum, we're going to want to be looking for the post scutellum. So that is underneath the scutellum, all right? And so we're looking here right where the, essentially right where the thorax meets the abdomen. All right, so this right here is our scutellum, remember? And then right underneath, right about here, this is going to be our, our post scutellum. And so you can kind of see that it looks enlarged. It almost looks like the fly is like a little fat. I don't know. You see it kind of looks like it bubbles out of the body. That's what they call enlarged. All right. So it's not like huge. It's not obtrusively large. But if you look underneath the scutellum, you can see that it looks like it has a little bubble. All right, this little post scutellum. And that is how you identify a tachinid from the other spiky flies. So um, we might be able to see it on the other specimen also. Now for me, this is a characteristic that is not always super evident especially d depending on how you've pinned your specimen. Sometimes the way that you pin your specimen um, and how the abdomen is sitting will kind of stop you from seeing that body part. And then you have to kind of go on other characteristics, like the hairs. Um. All right, so for this one, for instance, I don't think that we're going to be able to see the post scutellum. 
So you can see that it has all of these, it's really spinos, it has all of these crazy hairs all over its body. Um, but when we zoom in, we're trying to look underneath this shelf right here. So the post utellum would show up right about here. And you can kind of see that it's expanded, right? Like at about that focus right in here, you can kind of see that it is expanded. But that's something that's really, really difficult to um, see. Or as my nematology professor once told me, if you imagine it, it's there. I'm not kidding. He said that. I love Dr. Bird. He's the coolest teacher. And he taught nematology at Michigan State. And um, we were we were looking at nematodes under the microscope. And you may know nematodes are very, 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 very small. Incredibly small. In fact, you can kind of, you can put them on the end of a pencil tip and you can't see them. All right. Um, and so we were learning how to mount and identify nematodes. Um, and we were trying to find some very small characteristics, some spherical or respiration hole. And it literally is just this little itty bitty glint of a thought on a nematode. And he was like, yeah, right there, that glitter. Did you see that? And I was like, I, maybe. He's like, well, if you imagine it, you can see it. And it's like, Yes, this is true. And so sometimes microscopy is like that, especially with especially with things that are really small. Really itty bitty teeny tiny. All right, I have four more families that we can chat about um, before we are logging off. And I'm gonna tell you, there are a variety of flies that I have in my collection that I have not identified to family yet. And so um, when I... When I am figuring those out, I'll probably do another live stream. Um, that one will be a little less um, planned out, I guess, because I'm going to have to identify them. So it's probably going to take a little bit longer. All right, so we have four more left. The next one we're going to be talking about is the are the Tifridids. The Tifridids are fruit flies. Now, um, you may think, aren't fruit flies Drosophila, right? And every science class you've ever gone into, if you learned about Drosophila, you called them fruit flies. Well, um, yes, the common name for Drosophila or Drosophility um, can be fruit flies, but the Tifridids called it first. The entomologists say that the tephridids are fruit flies. I want to know, I do want to know the story behind that. Um, I wonder if the geneticist who did Drosophila um, wasn't an entomologist and so didn't know that the fruit flies already were a common name. I'm not sure. All right. All right, so with the fruit flies, with the tephridids, we're going to be looking at the end of the wing, all right, or the, the bottom side of the wing, and we're going to be looking for a very particular little kind of angle that comes out of the cell, um, and all tephridids or all fruit flies are going to have these. Um, there's a couple of char there are a couple of wing venation characteristics that we'll look at, but that's the big one that I remember saying, oh, that's how I know. Um, we'll look at a couple of different characters also. because I can see it, but this one is going to be a little bit difficult because of the lighting situation, huh? Let's try the other wing. So 
one thing that we are going to first notice is that the wings have a very spotted or a distinctive pattern. A lot of times fruit flies are going to have very distinctive patternings on their wings. Um, this patterning is a lot more than most fruit flies, all right? So this is very, very patterned, very, very modeled wings, which makes it a little bit more difficult to see this projection, pro projection off the anal cell. But we got this, guys. All right, so this is going to be the front of the wing up here out of focus. This is the back of the wing or the anal section of the wing. This is the anal cell right here. So you can see that it moves up this way and it comes down at this angle, right, that vein. And then it kicks out. You can see it has this V right here and then it comes back. This is the this is kind of the shape of the anal cell and this projection right here this little kick out what looks like a little shoe or a little toe of the vein that's the characteristic for um for this family. All right? So fruit flies are going to have this this like crazy looking anal cell on their wings. And they've got it on both sides, right? Because insects are going to be same on both sides and I wonder if the other side would be any easier to see it's right here yeah so it's a little bit difficult because because of the modeling on the wings but the vein comes down like this and goes out like that All right, and so that's going to be the characteristic on our fruit flies. Now, there's another characteristic that has to do with the, um, the costal and the subcostal veins on the front of the wings. Um, so it has to do with this area, this area of the wings, the super dark area. And I'm going to tell you, we're not going to be able to see it right now. Um, because of the thick modeling on these wings, um, that's just going to be a little bit too difficult to see on this specimen, I believe. Um, yeah. Not happening. But that's what a fruit fly looks like, ladies and gentlemen. A real true fruit fly. And they do tend to be larger, right? So people look at those little itty bitty fruit flies that are flying around. Um, and fruit flies tend to be larger than that. Okay. Alrighty, let's see. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Alright, so our next family that we're going to be looking at. Or the Siomizids. Let's see. These are the marsh flies. marsh flies there's going to be a couple of characteristics that we're going to be looking at the marsh flies also tend to have those modeled wings so they tend to have very colorful or modeled wings very similar to fruit flies all right um so we'll be looking at the anal cell to see if it has that projection it doesn't right and then um, we're going to be trying, we're going to attempt to look up at the, we're going to look, try and see if we can see the subcosta. I think that with this specimen we'll be able to see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
community. So I just listed a handful of characteristics that we are going to be looking at. The specimen that we have, um, the specimen that we have doesn't have as strongly modeled wings as some marsh flies do. All right. So we'll see that the modeling is not is not strong with this one. We have some coloration here in the wings and that's pretty much it. So this one is like not all of them, but most of them. All right. And if it is incredibly modeled, it might look a lot like a fruit fly. So then we would look at the anal cell. So we're, that anal cell is going to be very close to the base, right? It's going to be kind of along the bottom. All right, and so you can see that this one doesn't have an extra angle that kicks out, right? So this um, this anal cell is closed, but it doesn't have that it doesn't have that strong projection, and so that's going to be one thing we're looking at. The other characteristic is up here in the top, up here in the top of our um, of our wings. Let's see. All right, so right here, this is going to be the costa or the first vein along the wing, and then this little friend right here, this guy right here. That's going to be the subcosta, and this is R1, all right? To give you a little bit of an idea of frame reference of, like, the veins on this guy. And so if we're looking right here at the subcosta, or the SC, um, it angles up, and it angle and it ends at into the costa, right? So the subcosta ends at the costa, and there's not a 90-degree angle. Now... In fruit flies, this was something that we weren't able to see on the fruit fly because it, the veins were too mottled or too dark. But on fruit flies, this subcosta right here will, will extend out and then it will go up at a 90 degree angle. All right, so that's going to be the differences between these two families, between the fruit flies and the marsh flies. Also, where you collect them. That can be a difference, right? So if you have data about where you collected or what you collected your specimen on, that'll definitely help you with identifying some flies. Alrighty, so we've got those marsh flies or this guy's eomyids. Two more! Alright, so the scaphophagids for me, I haven't, I haven't found a character that I really, really like for, um, if you see it, if you see this, you know it's a scaphophagid. Outside of the fact that all of the scaphophagids that I have personally seen are fuzzy and yellow. <laughs> all right, let's look at it. And the scathophagids are generally, I mean, they're known as dung, dung flies. And they stay true to that, they stay true to that, that, um, this one was collected, this one was collected on a farm, on poop. So, um, it's definitely something that, If you know what you collected the fly on, it's going to be easier for you to identify it. And then... Alright, so they tend to be yellow and fuzzy. The character that you'll see a lot of times is that the ventral side of the scutellum on these flies are lacking any type of hair or fur or fuzz. So we'll be able to look at that too. Awesome. All right, so that is a dung fly.
<laughs> all right they are very much yellow and fuzzy all right like bright yellow um uh they can be found in large numbers where they have lots of food if you've got lots of poop for them you will find them okay um the characteristics the characteristic of the ventral side of the sputellum, if we were looking at it, we have to remember what the sputellum on our fly is. So remember when we were talking about the tachinids, we were looking at the post sputellum. Let's see. So our goal is to look under the wings. And sometimes it takes a little bit of extra finagling to get there. There we go. Not all the way under the wings. Don't go anywhere. Actually, this is a kind of cool angle for the scaphophagid. So this is where the wings connect to the thorax. This right here, where does it think it's going? This right here, this little stick with the little knobby on the end, that's the halter or the characteristic for all flies um, that because they don't have those hind wings. Now, if this is the scutellum right here, and if we're looking underneath, we're supposed to be looking at the ventral side of the scutellum. So I'm thinking, you see that there are hairs up here on the top on the dorsal side, but if you look underneath right about here, and it would probably continue all the way through here, but the wings are in the way. And you can see there is not any fur or hair right here in this general area. And that's one of the characteristics that I read for these guys. Um, although for me, I think that they have just a very distinctive body shape and like they have very distinctive characteristics. Cool. All right, so those are the scaphophagids or the poop beetles or the poop flies, the dung flies. We got one left. This is a small oddball family that I was able to collect in New Mexico. Thergodity. And the Pergodids are, I forgot their common name. What's their common name? I'm going to have to look up because I don't remember what the common name of these guys are. Okay, so we're looking at the pergodids and <laughs> Okay. So we're looking at the pergodids. You can see that just like those um just like the marsh flies and the fruit flies it has this modeling on the on the wings so if we were curious about that we could look down here and check it out but we would notice very quickly that the wing venation is very different from the wing venation of either of those two um, families so we would have a really hard time comparing even trying to find a cell the right cell to compare them 
very, very different um, in the ways of like where they are. Now, um, pergodids tend to have these kind of elongated or very noticeable antenna that protrude forward in front of their face. So you'll notice that he's kind of got this conical face with antenna that go forward. That's definitely one thing that I notice about most pergodids. Now, what we're looking for is something that doesn't exist. <laughs> All right. On most flies, if you look at the top of the head, right about here, in between the two compound eyes, you'll find three simple eyes, also called ocelli. All right. With pergodids, they don't have ocelli. All right. Um, and that's a character that is difficult to... That's difficult to describe without seeing what Ocelli looked like, I guess, huh? Anyways, Ocelli are going to look like, they kind of look like one of those, an individual Omatidia on the top of the head, right? So you can see compound eyes are made of lots and lots of individual eyes. Well, Ocelli, or simple eyes, are more, are are, well, more simple, right? So they're an individual lens, and generally, flies are going to have three ocelli. This guy, the pergodids, they don't have ocelli. And that's the characteristic for them. Whew. How are you guys feeling? I'm feeling a little tired from talking about all of these flies. I'm, a, I'm looking up the common name for pergodids because I, uh, I don't think there is one. Anyway, so fun, fun fact, um, the pergodids are the only are, well, let's say this. There are only two families in the entire order of Diptera that don't have ocelli. All right, so, um, and the other, the other one is even more rare. So the likelihood of you having a pergoded if it doesn't have ocelli is pretty good. Doop, 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 perfect. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now, um, we've got, went, we got to go over a variety of different kinds of flies. Um, we got to see them under the microscope, which I generally think is pretty cool. Um, checking out the wing venations. Wing venations are some of my favorites. Um, I've got all types of old sketches um, of wing venations that I've saved and collected over the years. Um, and I always think that someday I'm going to, you know, sketch out some really cool wing patterns. Um, with flies, wing venations is definitely what I prefer to look at over the, over the actual body and the numbers of hairs and those types of things, as you guys learned, um, but it is also something that I think I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to learn, especially if I, um, am going to be identifying any of the calophorids or the sar sarcophagids down further than family. Um, awesome. So, let's check this out. We got a handful of different families here that we covered today. There are a number of families that I don't have that we'll just have to talk about next time. All right. Um, I really hope that you guys are enjoying kind of watching these. I have had a handful of people come and go over the day. Hi. No problem. I'm glad that people have really enjoyed hanging out. And um, I will see you guys around next time. So today is Tuesday. The next time I'm live streaming is Thursday. You can come and see me from 2 to 3. And are we doing beetles or bees? I think we're doing bees. So on Thursday from 2 to 3, we're going to go through and we're going to do the bees, wasps, and the ants. All right? So we're looking at hymenopterans next time. And those, those I love. And so those will be fun to identify with you guys and kind of show you characteristics because we'll be able to look at the heads and the bodies and the, the little feet. Oh, man. And we'll be able to look at, I believe I've got a honeybee somewhere, so we'll be able to look at the, um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, so I hope that you guys have 
a wonderful rest of your night and um, the highlights for this video will hopefully be coming out tomorrow and I will see you at the next live stream which will be on Thursday during the day. Alright, bye guys!